Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kenneth Dyer, and I study circadian regulation of skeletal muscle at the Helmholtz Diabetes Center here in Munich, Germany. Uh, my research is focused mainly on understanding the physiological significance of these 24-hour gene oscillations that we've identified in different muscles. So which genes cycle over 24 hours? Um, why do they cycle? And how is their cycling important for health and disease? But today I wanna to briefly discuss circadian physiology and show why it's important to study metabolism from a circadian perspective. And I also wanna show how temporal profiling of metabolite steady state levels under different diets and exercise interventions can be a powerful tool to uncover mechanisms of health and disease. So using a combination of different approaches over the years, uh, we've uncovered a coordinated control of oscillating genes and metabolites, both by activity and feeding dependent mechanisms. And these factors can uh, impact metabolism and gene expression directly, or they can indirectly affect things by regulation of the muscle circadian clock. Again, our ultimate goal is always to understand the physiological significance of this oscillation. So how does oscillation of muscle metabolism impact normal muscle function and health, and how is this oscillation altered by disease? Uh, is it a cause or is it a consequence? So just to remind you all, uh, circadian rhythms are endogenously generated biological rhythms with a period of about 24 hours. And these include many behavioral, physiological, and metabolic rhythms like the ones you see here. So for example, body temperature, blood flow, hormone secretion, as well as feeding and locomotor activity patterns are all fluctuating rhythmically over 24 hours. Uh, and over the past decades, we've come to understand that all of these rhythmic processes are all controlled by circadian clocks. Now, circadian clocks are molecular oscillators and they're present in all the cells of your body. And they maintain cellular time according to the rotation of the earth. And this is thanks to interlocking transcriptional translational feedback loops, like you see here. And this whole process takes about 24 hours and again, is occurring every day in all the cells of your body. So clock controlled genes are these additional target genes that are integrated into this basic feedback mechanism. And these can be activated or inhibited depending on how they respond to the different clock related transcription factors. Now gene expression profiling in different tissues over 24 hours uh, has revealed that the vast majority of these clock controlled genes are tissue specific. And they often code for important transporters, uh, receptors and rate limiting steps and metabolic pathways. So while each cell has its own robust 24 hour clock in order for tissues, organ systems or multicellular organisms to operate efficiently as a functional unit, the individual clocks must be synchronized uh, by periodic stimuli called Zeitgebers, which is just a German word uh, for time giver. Now Earth's 24 hour light dark cycle is the main Zeitgeber for the suprachiasmatic nucleus, uh, the central pacemaker in the, in the hypothalamus, which is circled red here. So the photic timing signal for whether it's day or night is transmitted directly from the eye to the SCN by specialized photosensitive retinal ganglion cells. Now in turn, the SCN activates the sympathetic nervous system uh, and uh, regulates feeding patterns, locomotor activity and body temperature rhythms. And in this way, the master clock in the brain coordinates the production and the distribution of a diverse array of metabolites, including steroid hormones, lipids, vitamins and cofactors that collectively can modulate gene expression. Uh, so daily entrainment is needed to ensure there's a strong coupling between the tissue clocks and to maintain this phase coherence between the central and the peripheral clocks. And, and uh, it's, that means it's very important to get outside and get your daily dose of sunlight. Now hormones and metabolites are important signaling molecules that tell the circadian clocks what time it is. And this occurs mainly through ligand activated transcription factors. So the presence or absence of these various signaling molecules relays external time to the genome and regulates clock gene expression. Again, this keeps the overall gene expression patterns and in the individual cells synchronized with one another uh, and maintains internal biological time in tune with the external environmental time. And this multi-level coordination reflects a hardwired transcriptional logic and a temporal coherence that underlies normal metabolism and physiology. And this has been selected for over millions of years of evolution on Earth. And so coordinating gene expression and metabolism with the time of day is important for maintaining health and for avoiding pathological consequences. But modern life often sends mixed messages that interfere with clock alignment. So this can include school or work schedules, 
uh, medications, stress, uh, whether we eat at night or even exposure to artificial light. So watching TV or staring at a tablet or a phone at night. Now shift workers or late chronotypes are especially susceptible to these discrepancies between biological and social time, uh, which is a term we call social jet lag. And these people show increased risk for severe metabolic, cardiovascular, psychiatric and neurological impairments, including obesity and diabetes. But to study these relationships in the lab, uh, researchers have had to develop various strategies to cause circadian disruption. Uh, for example, in addition to making mice obese and diabetic, a high fat diet is a good model to induce this kind of circadian misalignment. And thanks to many researchers working on this topic for some decades now, uh, we're getting a good mechanistic idea of how nutrition can affect the circadian clock and how this impacts gene expression and metabolism in different tissues. So even under a normal 24 hour light dark cycle, activity and feeding patterns are altered by high fat diet. And you can see this if you look at the distribution of activity and feeding events over 24 hours. So under a high fat diet, activity and feeding are no longer mostly restricted to the dark phase indicated by these black bars at the top. And this is especially evident when comparing the insides of the red circles. So activity and feeding are both increased during the light phase uh, under a high fat diet when the mice should normally be sleeping and fasting. And these changes are linked to blunted circadian oscillation in tissue clocks and altered metabolic coordination between the tissues. And we uncover these effects by measuring metabolites over 24 hours in eight different tissues of mice fed a regular chow diet or a high fat diet for 10 weeks. And you can see in these heat maps, this massive changes in metabolite abundance and oscillation induced by high fat diet. For example, under chow diet, the brown adipo, uh, adipose tissue normally shows a massive increase in lipids immediately prior to the dark phase. Uh, this reflects activation of bat thermogenesis prior to awakening. However, under high fat diet, uh, this is severely blunted with uh, these guanine nucleotides that are known to impair UCP1 mediated thermogenic uncoupling uh, were decreased or were increased, sorry. So together, this suggests that the high fat diet is impairing bat thermogenesis and reducing overall energy expenditure. So this could be a contributing factor to accumulation of fat mass. Uh, to investigate these metabolic relationships more systematically, uh, we calculated temporal correlations between metabolites within and across different tissues. Now these relationships encode dynamic, biologically relevant information regarding spatial, temporal, uh, biochemical, and functional links between the different tissue metabolites. So here the blue ribbons are showing metabolites across tissues that are positively correlated over time. And the red ribbons show metabolites that are negatively correlated. Uh, we hypothesize that metabolites sharing positive temporal correlation may have a common origin or function and may belong to related metabolic networks. Whereas metabolites that share a negative correlation may reflect temporal or spatial separation of incompatible metabolic pathways. Uh, we also think that temporal correlation of metabolites can serve as a general index for synchronization of the individual cells within a tissue, since these dynamic metabolic pathways should be highly correlated if the cells are synchronized. So when we plotted these metabolite correlations uh, across tissues, we saw tight coordination between serum, muscle, liver, and brown fat, reflecting their known shared metabolic roles. Uh, and it's a, diff a bit difficult to see here, but uh, under high fat diet, we also noted several new metabolite associations suggesting a coordinated multi-tissue metabolic response. And I don't have time really to get into all the details, uh, but one of the most striking findings was this massive loss in, uh, in inter-organ metabolite connectivity you see on the right compared to the left. So one of the cooler things we can do with this kind of data is that we can start to reconstruct metabolic pathways over 24 hours. For example, muscle glycolytic intermediates and acyl carnitines represent cytosolic or mitochondrial energy production. And both show a dynamic oscillation throughout the day under a chow diet and with the peaks confined to these distinct temporal windows, reflecting a clear delineation in the 24 hour fuel selection in the muscle. However, in the mice under a high fat diet, these glycolytic intermediates are blunted at night, so throughout the feeding phase, whereas the acyl carnitines remain at peak levels. Now, this implies an impaired metabolic flexibility and increased lipid metabolism is known to cause muscle insulin resistance. So when we view the metabolomics data from this temporal perspective, 
uh, we can get insight into when the differences might be most relevant for causing disease, um, as well as suggest when the best time is to administer a particular intervention, or even simply when is the best time to plan your experiments if you want to capture a particular effect. So we know misalignment between clocks promotes disease uh, and disrupts normal metabolism and interorgan crosstalk. But how can we promote realignment between misaligned clocks? Can clock realignment prevent or even rescue disease progression? Uh, so we know that exercise causes a wide range of beneficial health consequences, and it elicits a variety of physiological changes that are important for circadian clock alignment, including the production and release of various hormones and metabolites in addition to changes in blood flow and body temperature. So exercise has really been suggested as a, as a useful therapeutic for realigning misaligned circadian clocks. But uh, we're still at the beginning of this, of this topic. And so the precise timing, the type, intensity, and duration of exercise that we need to elicit these effects and other desired metabolic responses has really not been systematically investigated. So just like we did with the different diets, uh, we investigated the impact of a timed bout of acute exercise on metabolite levels in different tissues. And the idea was again, to construct a metabolomics atlas to add important perspective about how tissues independently and collectively respond to exercise uh, when it's performed at different times of the day and how the timing of exercise can impact tissue crosstalk. We also wanted to investigate the production and tissue distribution of these so-called exerchymes. So these are signaling molecules that are produced by different tissues in response to exercise. We wanted to see how they change according to time of day. Now this experiment was a little more logistically complicated to organize, but uh, our talented collaborators up in Copenhagen ran the mice for one hour on a treadmill, either in the morning around 9 a.m., uh, so three hours after lights come on in their animal facility, uh, or at night around 9 p.m., so three hours af after the lights are off. And then they collected skeletal muscles, uh, serum, liver, heart, hypothalamus, uh, epididymal and inguinal white adipose tissues, and brown adipose tissues. And they sent all these tissues to Metabolon in North Carolina for processing and metabolite extraction uh, to be measured using the non-targeted platform. So we got a really decent coverage of metabolites uh, across a wide range of metabolic pathways. And we were able to detect around 500 to 800 known metabolites in each tissue with 289 uh, common between all tissues. So we can start to look at how, how things are moving in these different tissues. Uh, so each tissue displayed uh, really a unique metabolic response according to the exercise time. And I apologize for the tiny fonts here. Uh, I just wanna draw your attention to the muscle at the top left. So exercise at ZT15, so at the night, altered 197 muscle metabolites uh, as compared to sedentary controls whereas only 52 metabolites are impacted by exercise as ZT3, so in the morning. And this was kind of the case for all the tissues actually, uh, with each showing a greater effect of exercise at night compared to exercise during the day. So I don't have enough time today to get into all the details of the different pathways and how they're all affected, uh, but I just wanna give a small sample of what the data tells us uh, and, and how we can use it. So if we just look again at all pairwise metabolite associations between different tissues independent of the time of day, uh, we see the opposite effect of what we saw in the high fat diet experiment. So here we saw increased metabolite correlations after exercise, suggesting increased tissue coordination uh, and communication compared to the sedentary mice. And this was mostly driven by increased connections between liver, muscle, heart, and serum, uh, which I guess isn't too surprising as mice rely heavily on the liver uh, to provide energy substrates for muscle contraction during exercise. But when we investigate the data according to exercise time, uh, we see some very interesting differences. So here, muscle and liver metabolites uh, were similarly coupled over 24 hours under sedentary conditions, independently of whether this sham exercise was performed at ZT3 or at ZT15. Uh, but conversely, exercise increased this 24-hour temporal correlations between uh, muscle and liver metabolites, but the effect was much greater at ZT15, as you can see here at the bottom. Now, our data uh, can also provide important physiological context about time and tissue-dependent exerchine production. 
Now these are metabolite signaling molecules for organ crosstalk that are produced and released by tissues in response to exercise. For example, we noted distinct differences among established exerkines uh, and most showed a greater exercise response at ZT15 than at ZT3, uh, especially here uh, with liver kynurenin and kynurenate. Uh, but on the other hand, ICAR uh, was selectively increased by exercise in the heart here at ZT3, uh, as was the serum uh, alpha-ketoglutarate. Now, I don't want to take uh, all day here to talk about all the changes that we saw, and I don't want to make you stare at tiny graphs, uh, but if we stratify the metabolite levels and correlations according to tissue, condition, and time, uh, we can begin, again, reconstructing these complex dynamic relationships across related metabolic pathways like you see here. So exercise at ZT15 rather than ZT3 appeared to preferentially direct skeletal muscle S adenosyl methionine metabolism uh, towards adenine nucleotide salvage, uh, as well as transsulfuration pathways linked to glutathione production and maintenance of cytosolic NAD. Tissue SAM levels uh, normally are exhibiting an endogenous 24 hour rhythm and the amplitude of uh, oscillation is increased by high fat diet. Uh, we noted that exercise here reduced the SAM levels in the muscle, in the liver and in the heart, but especially at ZT15, so at night. Uh, in muscle, exercise also reduced the downstream metabolites like 5-methylthioadenosine, adenosine and glutathione, while the ratio of oxidized to reduced glutathione was increased, uh, especially again at ZT15. Now conversely, muscle adenine and AMP were massively increased by exercise, but only at ZT15. And skeletal muscle contains the largest pool of adenine nucleotides in the body and maintaining their intracellular levels is really important to sustain ATP levels for muscle contraction. We know that intense contraction and ischemia degrades adenine nucleotides to their respective nucleosides and bases, which can then be lost by crossing the cell membrane. So to avoid potential metabolic stress and fatigue associated with this loss, it's important that the muscles balance adenine nucleotide degradation by increasing their salvage and de novo synthesis. Now we saw adenine conversion to AMP uh, seem to be increased by the availability of the metabolite PRPP which was selectively increased in muscle under sedentary conditions of ZT15, so a time-dependent increase. And it was reduced by exercise only at ZT15, so an exercise-dependent effect. And our results suggest exercise-induced adenine nucleotide salvage, uh, and this is regulated locally within the muscle in a time-dependent manner. And we think that this may play a role in the reported time of day differences in endurance capacity and as well recovery time after training. Now muscle is also known to be an important producer and net exporter of circulating glutathione and systemic glutathione levels are reduced by inactivity and aging, whereas exercise training is known to increase the levels and thus the overall systemic antioxidant capacity. Now the rate of glutathione production depends on cysteine generated from transsulfuration of homocysteine and increased flux of this pathway has been shown to delay aging and to increase lifespan in worms in flies and in mice. And the S adenosyl homocysteine produced from SAM mediated methylation reactions uh, is rapidly converted to homocysteine and in the presence of sufficient methionine and vitamin B6 proceeds via cystothionine towards formation of 2-ketobutyrate, cysteine, and ammonia. Now, as a structural analog of pyruvate, 2-ketobutyrate uh, is readily reduced to 2-hydroxybutyrate by lactate dehydrogenase, causing the regeneration of cytosolic NAD. Uh, since this is a near equilibrium reaction, we think that exercise-induced accumulation of 2-hydroxybutyrate in the muscle uh, likely reflects an increase in glycolytic flux. And this increase was much higher after exercise at ZT15, so at the night, suggesting a time-dependent difference in uh, glycolytic flux. So just to briefly summarize our key findings, um, exercise really consolidates metabolite correlations within and among different tissues. And this has obvious implications for the use of exercise to strengthen circadian clock alignment uh, and its therapeutic use in misaligned subjects. 
And we saw this effect was greater when the exercises performed during the early active phase. Uh, and we have some hypothesis as to why this may be the case. But uh, this kind of information can be used eventually for chronotherapy and really to design more targeted interventions in order to more efficiently realign disrupted circadian clocks. Now there's a lot of interest at the moment in exerkines. Uh, so why are they produced? What is their signaling role? And how can we harness them to promote tissue crosstalk and to correct metabolic diseases? So most of these have been identified in the blood of subjects after exercise, but their source, uh, the kinetics and the tissue distribution is often overlooked. Now our data suggests that these should be looked at from a tissue and time dependent perspective as their presence and relative abundance really depends on these factors. And finally, when we stratify the data according to time and tissue dependent signatures, as we saw, uh, that muscle seems preferentially poised to respond to exercise during the early active phase by linking adenine nucleotide salvage to glutathione synthesis and the maintenance of the cytosolic NAD. And this has really important implications, obviously, for time of day differences in endurance capacity and as well recovery time after training. So I just want to thank all my collaborators who worked on this project, uh, especially Shogo, who did a lot of the heavy lifting here, uh, organizing these very complicated exercise interventions and 24-hour tissue collection with Jonas's and Julien's groups up in Copenhagen. Uh, Dominic and I were lucky to get to jump in once the data was already collected to assist with the analysis and the interpretation. I also want to thank Julien for her support after Paolo passed away earlier this summer. Um, he's really such a pioneer and inspiration for all of us in so many projects and just such a positive influence, and he's really greatly missed. Um, Thanks also to Pierre Baldi's group for their bioinformatics support and to Yurik, uh, of course, for the opportunity to speak today. And thank you for your attention.